Greetings. Today I'm going to talk about why Adam named the animals. Now, as I've said many times before in these videos, I'm not interested in arguing about whether the story is literally true or whether it's a parable or whether it's symbolic. These are matters of personal faith. As a storyteller, I'm interested in what this story has to teach us. So, what can we learn from this? Why did Adam name the animals? Well, the plain sense of the text is that he simply named the species. Of course, he didn't do it in English. Jewish tradition says that it was Hebrew. Other creation stories probably have other languages. Uh, in Genesis, later on, we're told that all the world spoke the same language, which may not be so impossible. I mean, uh, scientists tell us that human beings are all descended from one small group of Homo sapiens in Africa, and at that point, they probably did have one language. Whatever, however that may be, the point is that Adam had speech human speech, and he called each animal by a specific name. Jewish mysticism says that Adam sensed the inner essence of each kind of animal when he gave them their names. And as some of you may already know, there's a system of numerology called gematria, where each Hebrew letter has a number, and if you add up these numbers in a word, you get a total, and those totals often correspond to the total of other words. And so there's a whole system where people take a look at what the inner essence of the animal was based on its name. Yet another way to understand the story, a very common one among both Jews and Christians, is that naming the animals gave Adam power over the animals gave him control. By the way, dominion is a very bad translation because it has the connotation of dominating, controlling. And that's not really what they were told to do. Adam and Eve were told to be fruitful and multiply and take care of the garden, to guard the garden. And so it's more like stewardship to take care of something but not to dominate it, not to exploit it, not to control it like a dictator. Here you go. Here you go. Come on. Come on, you can have some tools. Here you go. Come on. Come on. She goes for the whole piece. Anyway, when you do name an animal, you do have a certain amount of control. Your dog has a name. You call your dog. The dog comes to you. Which, by the way, is the reason why Jews do not pronounce the sacred four-letter name of God, because we don't have control over God. We can't conjure up God by calling his name. We can pray to God. We can call upon God, but we don't control God. And this is why we don't pronounce the name. And those names, Jehovah and Yahweh, those are made-up pronunciations anyway. Nobody today knows the true pronunciation of the sacred four-letter name, and that is probably best. So far, we have three different ways of reading this story. One, the literal, giving the animals a name in a language. Two, the sense of the inner essence of the animal. And three, stewardship over the animals in creation. I would like to add a fourth interpretation. And that is this. When you name an animal, you develop a connection to it. You develop a personal relationship with that animal. It becomes an individual and not just a member of a herd. You know, in that song, The Horse With No Name, you know, I've been to the desert on a horse with no name. You know, people are always saying, why the heck didn't the guy give the horse a name? Well, it's an old adage among cowboys and farmers also that you don't name something that you might have to eat. And there's many stories of expeditions, both in deserts and in the Arctic and other places, where they did have to eat their animals in order to survive. And so if you're in that kind of situation, you put a distance between yourself and the animal, and you don't name it. Now, today, it's exactly the same with the meat industry because most of us never see or know a live cow, a chicken, a goat, a sheep. 
These animals are simply nameless species. They are in some herd, in some factory farm that you've never been to. And there's no personal connection with those animals. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people don't have much compassion for the way animals are treated today, because they don't have a sense of, I am personally connected to that cow or that chicken or that goat. Now, keep in mind that the Garden of Eden was vegetarian. God says to Adam and Eve, I give you every green herb for food. There was no eating meat, no slaughtering in the Garden of Eden. And so I think when Adam named the animals, it was much more than just naming the species. I think it also meant that he had a personal connection to each one of those animals because there was no chance he was going to have to slaughter them and eat them at least as long as he was in the garden. Now, this is something we might like to think about today. You know, we talk about moving toward the time of Mashiach, toward the time of the Messiah, toward the time of world peace, toward the time of rebuilding of the temple and all of this other kind of stuff that talks about a utopia in the future. And that utopia is going back to Eden. And so perhaps we should reconsider whether or not we're eating the animals. And maybe we should learn to have a little more personal connection with all of the species on this planet.